Okay, I have my list here. Mary Hannah, I have you next. This was, you know, we, everybody had a reaction to the uh, Martin Luther King letter. And then I asked you to react to the next set of readings, the Black Humanist Alliance, the letter to Nancy Pelosi, the letter about Betsy DeVos, um, and then um, what was that other reading? Let's see. Um, this was the day before this, right? Uh, oh yeah, the anti-humanism. Um, so, Mary Hannah, go I, for it. I did react. Um, I did it right before we left, but I can. Oh, what did you say? I didn't write it down. Oh, uh, I talked about the vouchers. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And then I was talking about the um, where it said like police agencies to prohibit the use of the no knock warrants and institute mandatory de-escalation training for all officers. And how that led to like people wanting to take away like military weapons. Um, it went into that. And I just thought that could be a pro and con. Um, but I talked about that, but I did bring up the vouchers and that yesterday before you left. Yeah, okay. So I, I do hope you all go through those lists just to get some idea, just to be a somewhat educated voter, right? Or citizen. I mean, if you just think, you know, all you have to do is eyeball the list and you're in the top 90% of people who know anything at all, which is kind of sad, don't you think? I think it's sad. <laughs> I do. Okay, so um, Michael, I have you next. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so I took, um, I was looking at, it's part of the, uh, the I think it's a humanism, anti-humanism one. Um, and I think, I think you actually talked about it in today's video, if I remember correctly. Uh, but about, um, they were talking about, um, like making a, uh, uh, they were talking about, um, the sun. They're talking about the sun, making an artificial sun. Um, and sorry, I had it yesterday and I'm. Um, okay. Can you just pop back to me for one second? I didn't. I didn't have my notes pulled up from yesterday. And yeah, okay, that's fine. It does bring up a much bigger point that I do want it. It's super important. So we'll get there later. Uh, Akaya, what about you? Sorry, I was on mute. Let me. Pull my notes back up here. Unless somebody wants to go, I keep calling on the wrong person. This okay. is from yesterday, right? Yeah, and there were two, we do two things each, each day. So we had gotten, we had just started the second round. The first round is Martin Luther King. This one was either Humanism, anti-humanism, oh, yeah. or black humanism. I know that um, yesterday um, I talked about the the letter that they wrote to Nancy Pelosi. Oh, did you yesterday? Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I do have that down that, that you talked about that. Anything else you noticed from yesterday's reading that you want to comment on? That was mainly that stuck like what all stuck out to me in that reading. Okay. So, and you should step back and think about it. This is the kind of uh, correspondence that's going on between our politicians, as opposed to whatever the news, whatever news you get, right? So I, you know, there's layers and layers of dialogue between people that, and just like there is in your households, right? Just there's, complicated dialogues and all of them affect our worldviews, right? So just to get a sense of how complicated things are. Um, Jason, have you gone yet? 
No, I haven't. Um, I uh, was the one about like bigotry and Islam. Is is that part of this one, right? Was that part of this one? Okay, so um, uh, yeah, I'll react to that. Um, what I would say from that is that um, just reading through that and and how like they were using um Islam to like further like um their agenda, like how um Islam was like this big bad. Um, elephant in the room, but um, if you know, it's funny if people do their research, uh, they'll find that like they have a similar, if not almost the same, creation story to that of Christianity. They have their own version of Adam and Eve. Um, they even have their own version of Jesus and the and the um, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Not only that, but if people would know, uh, Jesus is actually mentioned in um, Islam. So I, um, it kind of like, I want to say it ticked me off, but like it. it push some buttons because they were using um islam to like like push christianity and and, and the way that um it was the right thing like the right religion and the only religion and i didn't like that because i mean i am christian myself but like in, you know to use something like that like something like that to like um it's push. called it's called it we, it's called weaponizing religion. Right, and and it wasn't even to like push uh, Christianity. It was just a, a a whole agenda that they had. So and it wasn't it, nothing religion related about it. So it was just to push a whole agenda. So that's that's what I um my whole reaction from that was. Anybody else want to comment on that? The weaponization of religion. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll come back on that. Um, that kind of reminds me of like um, how um, the um, like I don't know if it was like that like this in other um, states, but like in Texas, we were studying like Texas uh, history and and U.S. history about like the whole push. Um, I forgot what it was called. Like, um, was it called like when they were saying it was like God's will to move to the West and how um. Like they were basically just like mowing down everybody in their way. They they weren't worried about like whether it was already their land that was there already, and and how um you know they said it was the will of God for them to uh, move into the West. And there was a whole there's even like a I forgot what it was called, but it, it, it um I'm sure some maybe somebody here knows. I don't know. Uh, Trail but, of Tears. Uh, no, not, it was, um, not that I, I know that, but, uh, it's like, I forgot what it's called, but basically like it was, they were just what, like you said, uh, weaponizing religion to just, um, to say like, oh yeah, this is the right thing to do. They were basically, um, just like mowing down anybody in their way, any idea, um, ideologies, any beliefs that was there prior to them being there, they just was out the window with them. So you could follow the golden rule, of course, treat other people the way you want, except those aren't real people, right? Like they're, they're out to get us or they're not fully human or something. There's some reason why I can break the golden rule, right, Jason? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Anybody else wanna chip in? Mm, I guess just a general opinion is, I feel, I hopefully speak for all the main religions with this, but if you get to the point where you're weaponizing religion, you basically have a skewed view of it because as far as I know, I don't remember any religion promoting or endorsing violence to get their way. So once you're at the point to where you're weaponizing it, I feel like you've become corrupt and you're only thinking in a selfish manner. Okay, so starting today, we start with Confucianism, Hindu, Buddha, and Islam. So we are gonna talk about that, but yeah, I've sort of set you up, right? For there's a humanist branch of each of these, and there's an anti-humanist branch of each of these. Everybody understand that? There's a branch that focuses on the doctrine if you don't believe this, there's trouble. Um, and then there's the, the humanist branch always focuses on the virtues, your way of life. 
So you know what to look for, you know what this class is going to focus on. But to tell you the truth, any kinder, in any kindergartner can tell you that, right? <laughs> they know <laughs> who's behaving and who's not, and they don't listen to their doctrines or their theology. <laughs> They just, you know, they know who's the better baseball player and they know who hits who. And that's about it. Okay, so um, let's see who else. I guess it's Caitlin and Michael. So Caitlin, go ahead. Um, so the one quote that stuck out to me was relying, it was from the Black Humanism Alliance article. It says, relying on rare appearances or a single representative of a given group is tokenism, not actual diversity. I feel like a lot of times in our society, we'll say like, for example, like when Obama was president, like, look how far we've come as a country. Like we have an African-American president, like, but obviously that doesn't actually represent how our society treats African-Americans. So that one just really stuck out to me. And then in the... Um, are we talking about the anti-humanism right now too? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I thought it was interesting how they were talking about uprooting humanism, calling it like atheist and lethal. Um, I think like, like parts of humanism is just a part of how everyone should think because obviously we can't just sit around and wait for God to do everything. Like that's not why he put us here. Like we have to make our own decisions and do our own things as well. But um I just think that that's kind of a hypocritical thing to say from a Christianity standpoint. So I, I mean, know. why would there be a judgment day if everything you did was God's yeah, will? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's kind of okay. Like I know that everything you did was my will, but I'm going to make you roast in hell anyway. Just yeah. Just <laughs> I like mean. that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was what I had. <laughs> you guys, people. I, uh, their theology is not so right <laughs> okay thanks caitlin i appreciate it i don't think god's gonna judge you if he set you up to fail <laughs> uh, okay michael um yeah i was also just gonna uh like talk on that for a second because I remember you talking about it in the the video from today and I kind of feel like it, it's almost like a like um like yeah we're not gonna like change we're not gonna make any like decisions on our own we're gonna let like God do it but at the same time I feel like like every day and we're obviously all making decisions um but they're kind of excluding themselves from decisions about you know environmental science or climate change you know i don't know um but what i was going to say about the you know when they were talking about um humanists and making the artificial sun um uh yada yada um i was going to say that um uh, one second had it and I lost it. I'm trying to find. Oh, um, I was gonna say that. So, it's kind of like, it's like interesting because they talk about humanism and and the way that like, uh, well, one, I kind of enjoy how not enjoy, but I do like like how humanism talks about you know like um making i guess making the best of your time here on earth you know i don't know and obviously that can lead to like uh, uh like i guess greed and like you know um doing too much but like at the same time you know they talk about humanists um kind of overusing like resources and that kind of thing um but then you know the people that are saying this are also the same people that aren't i mean not necessarily with anti-humanism but then when you look at like um people do follow religion we just talked about how they too don't really want to do anything with um climate change either so it's kind of like you have these two different sides uh and both of them are i mean that both of them follow like two kind of different different things but you still end up with like no change anybody else want to comment on that
Um, I have another comment on the article itself. Overall, just found it kind of funny how they spoke so bad about humanism and the anti-humanist part, and they never actually referenced anything. Like they went on talking about how the signers promote themselves as the brains of the human race, but they produce a document remarkable for its utter lack of common sense, boundless fate and human reason, total inability for to fathom human nature and stuff like that. But they never said anything specific that they wrote that proved their point. And I read on and it was basically going into the last page where I thought they were finally gonna say, finally say an example, but they basically it in a feudal public in nation, for example, they said humanist ideas dominated for 150 years and had time to put down deep roots. And that was it. They basically said nothing that nothing specific that actually proved their point of how supposedly stupid or not non common sense it is. I just found that kind of funny. Okay, so one point I wanted to make by putting these attachments together is that, do you remember after 9-11, there were some editorials saying, this is a time to come together, right? This is so important. And, and there, you can go back and look at that, right? He's saying Bush had has a chance to bring us all together, but every day, you know, he's not taking advantage of that chance. I want you guys to get a sense of what people were thinking at the time, because there's going to be another 9-11. There's going to be climate issues. There, there's going to be a crisis. And so you need to anticipate the crises and you need to react appropriately. And it's the way to do that is to study what happened before. But I think a lot of history books, it's too remote or you don't get really specific things. So 9-11 is not that remote right about when you were born. And we have specific data. What were people thinking? What were people saying? And most of all, we had a chance to come together. And Mr. Cheney, and this is all the history, the books will tell you this. George Bush deferred to his vice president. His vice president deliberately, and I can give you the documents, used the moment to, to use an excuse for us to invade Iraq because they had wanted to do that before. So the day after 9-11, they sent an email to their buddies. We have to tie this to Saddam, even though it wasn't they knew Saddam didn't do it because there weren't al any Al-Qaeda in, in Iraq because Saddam hated Al-Qaeda because he's a secular guy. But they used it and that was, and then they used religion and the whole thing became a huge divider. So I do want you to take that seriously because it, it, it will happen again. When there's a crisis, there will be the people who want to use it to further divide us, or there will be people who want to use it to unite us. So be prepared. <laughs> and if you wanna write your paper using quotes because you want to remember this lesson, um, I would, you know, I'd be very open to that. But I, again, I can't stuff something down your throat. I'm not gonna tell you what you care about. I'm telling you, I grieve about this because it was a chance. And, and I mean, George W. should have stepped up and done it. I even have a quote that you read for today that before 9-11, Laura Bush said Roe versus Wade should not be overturned. She said it publicly, right? After 9-11, Abortion is going to be one of our 
ways to divide the public and polarize. Shut up, Laura. And she did. Okay? This is cynical. This is cynical politics. Don't let yourself be a sucker, right? The gay rights. Mr. Cheney has a gay daughter he loves dearly. Chick. Don't talk about it. We're going to use it to win an election. We've taken all the Gallup polls, punch the button, right? Please, please. And so, Trey, you know, when you say, we say we care, but we don't do anything, when, when we don't do these things to create a decent social fabric, People don't have time or energy to actually do the things they'd like to do because they can't even survive. Does that make sense, Trey? It isn't necessarily because they don't care. It's people just have that many more obstacles because of things like this, these watershed moments. We didn't use it to weave the society together. So now we have all these broken threads and we have to try and bring ourselves together. And we're just set back. We have a huge setback and we still haven't recovered from it, but it's up to you, you know, 20 years later, you know? So the, uh, the other point, you know, with Obama, I don't know who on earth thought it was a post-racist society, but nobody who's living in the South and listened to people talk right, would have ever thought that because, you know, Obama stoked racism. I don't know, is that, I just, you know, I would hear all this stuff. People just despised Obama. And um, I think it just sort of made the racism clearer and more vivid. But again, that's, that's the way when something gets politicized, nobody can agree on anything. So all I'll say is some people would think it showed that we're beyond racism. Other people think it showed how racist we really are. So what is it, right? Well, it's probably something in between. Anyway, it's way too simplistic to say that that showed a post-racist society, right? I think the reason he got elected was the economy was absolutely tanking right at that moment. And it was clearly because of Bush's policies. So, you know, the Republicans weren't going to win that election. But, you know, three months later, because the public forgets so easily, or three months before that, because it wouldn't have happened yet. Anyway, um, the, uh, the thing about bigotry that I want to say. Um, okay, so the excerpts from Betsy DeVos, I explained that last time about putting a billionaire who went to private Christian schools in charge of the public school system for the US, right? That's cynical. It's a cynical um, uh, move. She, she had spent a decades trying to get rid of the public schools in, I think it's Michigan. It wasn't, you know, charter schools were not showing themselves to be better schools, but she's just fixated on it. So he picked her <laughs> and then she fixes it so that these private schools get funding during COVID. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I mean, I just, I have trouble with that. Um, and, but what I really want you to think, when people start talking about the government, look at what the government did. Well, who is the government, right? Betsy DeVos, yeah. And then Obama put someone in charge of the Department of Education that would have done something totally different. So please don't equate those. <laughs> they aren't the same, <laughs> right? So try to get out of that habit. It's a very pre prevalent habit, actually. I hear it a lot. Um, then uh, Michael's comment about making an artificial sun and then combined with Tardis. Uh, Titus. All right. So it, that article did 
um, have a lot of generalizations, but it had that one specific point, right? Now look at this, look at what he did. He did not quote from a humanist manifesto. He quoted from something that somebody who signed the manifesto had said in another context. Is that a, you know, it's it's a fact that he said that, but is that a distorted, a distortion of humanism? I mean, humanism says we don't have any one doctrine, we're always changing, just because, all right, you guys, so say you have a petition that goes around uh, that you want to get um, seaweed salads, you know, in the, in edge, right? And you get half of the school to sign on to it. And one of the signers said something nasty about Dr. Grafton or something. And then oh, all those seaweed people, they always, you know, they hate Dr. Grafton. <laughs> Does everybody understand this? This is distorted right? Distortions. And it happens a lot. So be careful. You can, you trash this whole tradition. There's classical humanism, there's Renaissance humanism, there's this humanism, there's that, right? You know that. And somebody comes along and says, humanists are arrogant, and they want to use technology to absolutely save the world. And this one guy that signed one of the manifestos, said he wanted to create another son and therefore they're awful and you shouldn't pay any attention to them. Is that a good way to argue? All right, be careful. Don't do it and don't be a sucker. And um, you might wanna take logic class. It's called anecdotal evidence. Uh, it's a flaming fallacy. I don't know if the person who wrote it actually knows it's a fallacy or not because people do it. And people, it becomes part of the culture to do that. And people don't even know that that's really bad reasoning. Okay. The other thing would be um, the bigotry in Islam. This is important because it was a quoted from, it wasn't just any old person. It was Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham. So it's very important to think about history and the generations. And one way you can tell a society's in decline is when the children of the moral exemplars are corrupt, all right? So, and this is, I can't believe it. It's like out of a movie. So two prominent people that came out after 9-11 uh, condemning uh, the liberals. Actually, Billy Graham, I, that wasn't his premier thing. He was, you know, he had moral fiber, right? But his son does not. His son is into the power. Billy Graham would not say stuff like that. He doesn't have that kind of animus. Does everybody understand that? I mean, you could do research on that. That's a serious issue because Billy Graham ended up creating this huge empire. I mean, it's huge, but his son inherited it and his son is not a nice guy. And he's using that power. He's abusing the power. The father did not abuse his power. The son is abusing the power. Another interesting point is he had a boy and a girl. His girl was a complete angel. Like she followed him. She had moral character, but she couldn't inherit the empire because she was a woman. Franklin Graham was an SOB little spoiled that brat kid. He rebelled. He did his little ditty, but then he came back to take back the empire because he liked the power. All right. And he is on the board of Liberty University, okay? And he is Mr. Power Hunger. All right, Jerry Falwell 
was one of those ministers that said, you know, uh, it's because the country was being taken over by um, those liberals that God allowed 9-11 to happen. So let me. Wait, um, Dr. Beck. Yeah. You said he was on what board for, you said Liberty University? Yeah. Have you heard about that? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I just had that. Yep. Liberty University was started by Jerry Falwell. So let me explain this to you because I do want you to know that I have, at the end of the day, I think it's the liberals that should have been responsible and they weren't. And I was, I know that because I had to read their stupid books and kiss up to them and all that. So I know who they are, but anyway, um, I do, I do think that liberals lost this tradition of unifying reason and faith. Too many of them were too flagrantly atheist and uh, either morally weak or morally indifferent to the public or flat out corrupt. But I, again, I can't go into all of that. But let me go here with this one, right? So Jerry Falwell is, um, here he is. I really believe that the pagans, the abortionists, the feminists, the gays and lesbians who are actively trying to make an alternative lifestyle, I point the finger in their face and say, you helped this happen, okay. And then he started Liberty University because a lot of people with a lot of money know that they can get the, the right-wing religious folk to hate socialism and promote capitalism and not want any government intervention in the capitalist system. So of course, they're going to support economically the evangelical, whatever you want to call them, I, right wing. Um, okay, so that happened. But I have to say that right the day after 9-11, uh, I go into classroom and the student says, Dr. Beck, you're not going to like what Jerry Falwell said. <laughs> and there was a newspaper article, whatever. And I said, you know, I understand it because he went to college. And he had a teacher, probably a philosophy teacher. He probably had to take it, right? Who said to him, I'm going to beat the religion out of you, right? And so Falwell reacts, right? So Falwell didn't make this stuff up. He had that experience. And then he probably talked to other people who had that experience. And he figured this happened all over the country. And so he decided to start Liberty University. And it's huge. If you go online and look at the campus, huge. All right. Recently, and I can give you these, these news articles if you want, his son obviously is on the board and inherited the Falwell empire. But his son is, is totally into sex, sex and money. OK, so Franklin Graham is into power. And uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. is into sex and money. So he had a lot of friends who were real estate. Actually, he was a real estate guy on the board and he just made contracts with his buddies. So he got a whole bunch of his buddies, it made them millionaires uh, building buildings for Liberty University. Then he used to go have these sex parties at the swimming pool thing. And he, you know, there was a sign outside of the whatever it is resort saying, leave behind, you know, your clothes and your religion and whatever. <laughs> so he, you know, he's corrupt. Um, and I think he was asked to step down from the board, obviously. Um, but that that isn't just about one little family. That's when history books are written, they really need to include how a culture de declines, right? How it degenerates. 
and um honestly there's no good guys and bad guys like jerry falwell went to college he had some knee-jerk liberal you know draw one extreme cause another extreme reaction then his son goes another direction and that's one thing about being an older professor is that i literally saw all this stuff and i can give you quotes and i just want you to really learn from this because your life is so affected by this um and so then i mean <laughs> Here's another irony that I do not think Pat Robertson knows. He says, you're not, you know, you say you're supposed to be nice to the Episcopalians, blah, blah. I don't have to be nice to the Antichrist. 85 of the people who signed the Declaration of Independence were Episcopalians. <laughs> okay, guys, now he's calling our founders the Antichrist. And he doesn't even know it. And he's also, I mean, there's whole curricula based on this. There are probably, there are probably hundreds of thousands of American children who are raised to think mainline churches are the Antichrist. Um, our goal is a Christian nation. This is, that is not what the founders wanted. We don't want pluralism. Our founders wanted pluralism. And the reading for tomorrow literally describes the founders uh, embracing Confucius Analects and setting up virtue clubs, okay? <laughs> ben Franklin, all these guys. And yet the people who are leading our, the Christian part of our Christianity are exactly the opposite of that so that is something to worry about and it's something that i i worry about for my students because you are inheriting this horribly toxic culture um i added these last two just recently so you didn't have to read them they're totally optional i think i'll go over them uh, for um just a minute but let's see, any other, did anyone, what did I say? Um, okay, any other comments? Well, okay, let me go over this for a second about racism and then we have to move on to Confucius. Um, all right, this is the outline of a 25 page document about qualified immunity. And if you want to read the document, um, the Constitution, all right, it just gives an example, you know, of unjust treatment. And the Constitution protects equal protection under the law, right? Even by law enforcement. But over the decades, judges have invented a legal doctrine to protect law enforcement officers from having to face any consequences. It's called qualified immunity. And in real life, it operates like, like absolute immunity. So I think you should eyeball this and you should know this as a citizen so that when people start talking about, you know, police brutality and stuff, you don't just have examples, right? You have the fact that the judicial system has supported the police officers. And so, you know, we have to change. That's why you had the, I mean, the legislature, the Congress has to pass bills that would make these things illegal. And, and the Supreme Court then would have to follow the laws that the Congress passed. But right now, even though the Congress passed a law which the, ju the judicial system could have interpreted differently, they did not. They interpreted it in favor of the police officers. So the only step, the only next step is to go back to the Congress and have them pass um, laws. That's why Nancy Pelosi recommended that, right? 
she wants a new she wants to pass some laws that would even up the playing field so so in order to avoid polarization i do think it's important to get the facts right um i do have um I also read about the judicial theory of original intent, if anybody wants an outline of that, because now the Supreme Court majority goes back to the original intent of the founders. And the other point of view is that after um, the Civil War, the amendments 13, 14, and 15 really recreated the constitution. And there's a whole different way of deciding um, judicial decisions that go, that refer to 13, 14, and 15 on the assumption that when we didn't have slaves, we became a different country because we interpreted equality differently, substantially differently. So, jurisprudence right there's one jurisprudence that goes back to the founders and there's one jurisprudence that says wait when it comes to human rights it makes a difference if we had slavery or not um the other thing about original intent is that it originally there was extreme freedom to do anything you want to the land right and so we still have these laws where you can pollute the air, pollute the water, cut down your trees, use pesticides, herbicides, like that's your freedom. Um, and that, you know, the Environmental Protection Agency tries and then it gets undone. It's just original intent means doing nothing about climate change unless Congress just has to pass some laws that would substantially alter the original intent. But six out of nine judges will go there unless there are some laws passed by Congress. So if you wonder why don't we do anything about climate change, that's why. Okay, and then the color of law is about housing. And um, I did start out um, writing about what I think is the main uh, lesson from these things and what I learned from reading the book. Um, so, and then you can compare it really. I don't know if any of you have lived in places where the value of your house has gone up substantially. I don't know how many of you have substantial equity in your house. Um, you could ask your parents, but Overall, as a matter of the country as a whole, this is a huge deal. Many middle-class people, it's a major source of their wealth, even though not their income, but their wealth, which matters more. Um, and then I think a lot of you aspire to getting a house that on the kind of loan that includes paying partly the bank and partly on the principle of the house so that you do build equity. So I, you know, college educated people should believe they can have a house in a decent neighborhood where they're paying down, they're paying on the principal, they're getting equity, and the value of the house also goes up every year. So they even get more value than what they even paid in. So I'm hoping for you that you can do that. That's a major reason to go to college is your overall wealth. It isn't just your income in the first job you get. It's looking forward in, you know, for four decades. It's a big issue. So I just gave my own example of how I could never have gotten my kids through college without the equity that my parents had on the houses that they gave us and all this sort of stuff. Um, and then I was going to write an outline on the whole book and I just thought this is gonna take forever because it, the book is super good because every single sentence is another piece of evidence of this whole story of how African-Americans were not given 
um, access to being able to buy houses in decent neighborhoods that would build equity and how disastrous that is. So I started out chapter one and then uh, I just had to quit. It was gonna take me forever. But if any of you have a chance, um, another lesson to learn from this is how important it is to read. But you do have to find the books that are worth reading, right? And so, I mean, I will make recommendations because there's some books I've read that really hit the spot for me, right? They really, I am so glad I read this because it completely expanded my worldview permanently, right? Um, so anyway, and, and, you know, I have some other ones in mind, but I don't like to push students. I just do want to tell you that um, I read to inform myself, but I also, you know, don't, you know, I'm not competing against anybody. I would love for other people to be informed also. Um, so if you, if you want to ask me, you know, what books have you read that, that you think really speak to issues of the time uh, in a more informal setting? Sure, but I, I'm not in a class, I don't think. Um, does anybody want to give a final comment about, this is uh, the section of the class on practical wisdom, right? On citizen consciousness. And the usually I have it that the second paper is, well, I'm, I'm gonna do it that way. You can't write on Confucianism yet even though we're gonna cover it this week. I No, that's not gonna be true because we're, we're just gonna get so far. But usually I, I make students write something about practical wisdom, but I can't do that in the summer school. So you just, to me, you go back to Aristotle's virtues. They're the virtue of a citizen, right? Thinking about people you might never meet, you don't know, the thing you have in common is you all live under a common set of laws and you have to think about those laws. And um, so those qualified immunity laws, you have to think about how are they being you know, applied. And then for example, with the death penalty, you know, my students will say, well, I mean, I say it's racist, it's classist, you know? And they say, yes, but if you could do it justly, well, you never will be able to, right? That's not an option. It's not even close to an option. Don't fantasize when it comes to practical wisdom, right? Practical wisdom is practical, right? Okay, killing innocent fetuses is awful, yes but making it illegal just leads to more abortions. So, and it always will. So in that world, what's the best thing to do? Don't imagine a different world. It's this world. Okay, same with death penalty. It never will be anything but classist and racist ever, ever. So in this world, should you have the death penalty, right? Um, so that's, that's the mentality of practical wisdom has to be practical. So you do need to get informed. Now, the thing that annoys me is the way that politicians don't, I don't have evidence that a number of them are informed at all. And there have been books about certain political leaders that say they don't know anything they don't know anything about what they're voting on. They, they've never, they don't read books and they don't talk to informed people and they don't, you know, hire people or get in groups of people that are informed and experts and talk to them. They only get into groups of corporate leaders who tell them what the laws they have to pass to get money for their campaigns. That's who they talk to. So I 
I think you should know that. <laughs> and you should know that that matters, right? Because practical wisdom is, because it's practical, it should be based on facts, right? It has to be based on facts, but it has to be based on expertise in experts that know where to get the facts and how to analyze the facts. And sometimes they disagree and then they need to talk to each other and you have to process that. That's the liberal arts tradition. That's the whole process of liberal arts education. And then as an adult, you just keep that process going. All right, anybody wanna make any last comment about this section of the class? on practical wisdom, on humanism, anti-humanism, polarization. Um, maybe, I guess I would like to ask you, each of you, do you think it affects your life? Do you think you have skin in the game on these issues or not, right? It doesn't matter to me if adults are polarized. It doesn't affect my life. Or do you think it does? Or do you think, I think it does, but I'm not quite sure how yet. Or yeah, I've been there. I know. And you give an example. So go ahead, um, Titus. Um, to be honest, I kind of feel it might have an effect, but I'm not 100% sure yet. My best answer is time will tell because I know eventually, especially the issues, they will come to light or they will become more exaggerated as time goes by, especially if we ignore them like we're doing now. So I well, guess actually, we'll see. Titus, that's encouraging because of course that means you've been able to go to school at Lyon for what, three years? without four. four years without experiencing that on the lion campus in a way that you know would cause you to say something which is really really good because it's not easy to create a campus and everybody's every coach and professor and staff member and administrator has to be committed to it uh, we can't control students but every single day every single employee needs to be making that effort or else it very easily can polarize. Does that make sense, Titus? Yes, ma'am. Do you think the employees at Lion do work on that? For the most part, I don't, well, I wouldn't say they emphasize it, but they're not doing anything like that's, that's super effective, so. I, it's nothing I have a problem with. Well, that's good. I don't, I don't know if the rest of you know, but people have to be very conscientious in order to make students so that they're uh, oblivious, <laughs> right? It's just like an Olympic athlete makes it look so easy, <laughs> but it's not, right? It takes a lot of practice. So I think the fact that it looks easy and it's not a deal means that you're going to a really good school, which of course, none of us has any particular control over other than our own behavior. So um, maybe it's just that Dr. Beck, she polarizes stuff, even <laughs> she's the hypocrite, yeah, it's possible. Uh, Trey, what do you think? Oh, you gotta turn on your mic. We were talking about the death penalty, right? Well, talking about anything to do with this humanism, anti-humanism, Black Lives Matter, practical wisdom, and Lion Campus, anything related to that? Uh, I think it's a lot to deal with um, in the world, but as far as like with everything going on on the Lion Campus, everything seems pretty smooth to me. Like the way we treat each other is cool. Like I'm, I'm a friendly person. Like I try to do my best to, you know, make friends with everybody, be cool with everybody. I'm very laid back, um, but I don't really see anybody, you know, bothering people too much. I don't really hear much about anything. So I think we have a pretty positive energy going around with, with everybody going around. 
So, I mean, I haven't heard anything, but if there is something going on, I'm sure that, you know, it won't, it won't take a lot to be fixed. I think um, I, there have been like a couple things, maybe, I don't know. I don't know, but if, if there has, I'm sure it won't take a lot to be fixed or something like that, because I'm sure everybody's on the same terms. Everybody has their own goals. Everybody has a focus that they're going through. So I don't really see anything. Okay, good. What about you, Akaya? Um, as far as like all the issues and stuff that are going on, I just feel like it's not affecting me now just for the simple fact that I'm not informed like I feel like I should be. Um, but yeah, like these issues um, that we're talking about, I do know about, but I'm not, like you said, I don't have much skin in the game. So um, I couldn't really just tell you how it would affect me or like give you my total viewpoint on these, so. Okay. Um, all right, Michael. Um, so, as far as like lying, um, just because that's kind of where everyone else started, um, you know, I feel like it's honestly more of a like, I don't want to say a facade. Um, and I don't mean from the professors. I mean, kind of from like higher up. I think uh, we get, we get, um, we, we get told certain things. There's, there's, you know, there's, you know, I think that like there was a, you know, there was a, there's a small focus on, um, you know, Black Lives Matter this past year. Um, but I think the college as a whole kind of allows, um, doesn't allow, but I mean, you know, no one's, no one's there to, uh, to, you just, we have so many students who don't want to listen and don't want to learn and don't want to like, uh, actually, you know, think critically. Um, and I feel like, I feel like, um, I don't know. I feel like, uh, as a whole line definitely could do, could do better, um, trying to get, get some of these students to um, to learn and to engage in conversations that they otherwise wouldn't have. Uh, obviously that is the point of liberal arts education. Um, but when, you know, when we're discussing something like the Black Lives Matter movement, I think that there was a lot of, um, I don't know, I think there was a lot of opposition um, that wasn't really, uh, there was a lot of opposition that didn't have a good, uh, I don't know, defense, I suppose. Um, and as far as talking about like having um, like skin in the game, um, it reminded me of one of the quotes from uh, the letter from Birmingham Jail. Um, and so I pulled it up and it was, um, the injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Um, and I do feel like we as a, as a society get caught up in the idea that, um, you know, as individuals, we can't create a difference. Um, but I think if everyone holds that same, that same idea, of course, we will we'll never create a difference um, because no one would ever be trying to create a difference. Um, but obviously, you know, we have to start somewhere um, and starting somewhere is with yourself. Okay, I do think if anybody would rejuvenate the Friends of Sophia, I think that would be a great place, the religion and philosophy student group, right? To keep having conversations because we ought to we ought to model you know have the premier model of that kind of behavior because you know it is the foundation of liberal arts education is religion and philosophy right right um, and i don't think that i i think the students that like would participate and go to um this the, the club um i don't think they're not really i guess the the students that i'm referring to it's the students that like they don't want to hear anything and they don't want, they're, they're, it's ignorance. Um, it's somewhat, it's ignorance. Um, it's that lukewarm person, right? <laughs> Remember the indifference? Remember Mark Luther King was really yeah. fed up with uh, moderate liberals who just stayed out of it, but they had these good opinions. Right. Yeah, okay. Jason, what do you think? Um, I don't know. I don't have much to say. I think a lot of people on here covered it, but I think um, you keep mentioning like having skin in the game, but 
Uh, I'm gonna be honest. At this at this stage for us, I I think it's like little to none. I think um, as like a, yeah, as a college student, we can vote and this and that. But as far as like making action happen, it, I think you got to step outside of that. You got to really kind of like um, work your way up, and not ne not even necessarily be a politician, but I don't know. I. I it's kind of hard to explain the whole like skin in the game thing. I like, I know everybody does, but like how much you have though, it, it varies from person to person. Well, we were talking about the K through 12 education, right? Right. The decline in the quality. So there right away, you could have had a better education before you got to college, but because of politics and polarization, you didn't. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. Uh, so you want me to talk about that? Well, I just, in every way, that's what I mean by it. I mean, you know, how come crappy food is cheaper than fruits and vegetables? That's socially constructed. That didn't drop from God in the sky, you know? Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I just think everything around us is affected by political life. Um, and that doesn't mean it has to be corrupted right? It's just that you take it in by habit and custom and you don't notice, but it's there. Yeah, um, I guess I'll just comment on what you just said about like, um, it's cheaper to, it, it's like kind of like, um, it's cheaper to, to like, to be unhealthy than it is to be healthy, which is kind of like, you know, we're looking for, we're all looking for longevity. Everybody's always looking for longevity, whether it's like life or school and, you know, whatever it is you want, and you always want longevity. And it's kind of like, um, it, well, I guess you could say like corrupt, like the fact that it, it's a lot more expensive to eat healthy than it is to like go to McDonald's and, and, and you know, quick, some quick temporary, uh, quick fix for appetite than for you to go home and, uh, you know, or go to a grocery store and buy this and, and do that and, and um, like cook for yourself. It's kind of like, you know, you can, or you, you just go down to your, your local fast food and buy a meal there, which is about like five bucks, as opposed to going to like the grocery aisle and and going to buy like, you know, fresh vegetables and going to your local market and that type of stuff. It's And um, yeah, I, I just wanted to comment on that. Yeah, well, actually it's cheaper until it's more expensive, which is when you get diabetes and heart disease and you need a knee replacement and a hip replacement and right then it's way more expensive it's like it's cheaper not to have social programs until people end up in prison and then it's way more expensive than it's right that's how it goes right it's we are impulsive we you know we are penny wise and pound foolish does that make sense jason yes ma'am oh i didn't mean to criticize yeah i didn't notice that you were eating huh. No. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Michael. Um, I was just going to kind of go off of one, something that Jason was saying. Um, and kind of, you do see that uh, like in more impoverished areas, you have people who are doing a lot more. Um, um, what's the word? The, the, the jobs, they're, uh, they're, they're like hands on uh, physical. It's like physical labor, you know, and these people tend to be more tired as well. And so, you know, when you go to go home, what's easier driving through the drive through or going home, cooking a whole meal, you know what I mean? And so I think that also plays into it as far as uh, like uh, with it economically uh, and people and what the food, the food is addictive also. Right. The chemistry in your body. Um, and, you know, books have been written about it. So, you know, we could pass laws and we could have customs. I mean, at least what we could do is not um, have the government uh, supporting corn, which is put into corn syrup, which is put into all our food, which gives us diabetes. Why? Why does the government supplement corn because there are corporations that give money to political campaigns that tell the politicians to do that. We don't, you know, that wasn't written in stone, you know? So anyway, I, I just, uh, as I said to Trey, I mean, you've got to focus on one thing, but you can't be naive about the way it all fits together either, right? And, and just 
look alive, you know, just know that political life affects you, that's all. Uh, so Mary Hannah, what do you think about any of this section on practical wisdom? Um, well, I'm just gonna point out that I agree with Michael with all that he said about the line campus and the whole Black Lives Matter movement. But as far as the whole skin in the game, I feel like um, I was also gonna bring up the quote, that's why I pointed his out, but um, I feel like we all will be affected uh, or are affected by everything that surrounds us, not just online campus, but worldwide. Like, I feel like everyone will be affected by climate change, for example, like we all do have a skin in the game when it comes to things like that. Okay, so liberal arts education also was trying to get people to think historically and globally, right? So we have to sort of look for patterns. Um, okay, uh, Caitlin. Um, so like as far as it goes from like my experience at line, like I've had some bad experiences because I kind of like shut down when people are like constantly pushing their ideas on me and I can't like, if I question them, then like I'm wrong and like they'll be angry because I don't just agree with them. And I think maybe that's something I need to work on is not shutting down, but I just, it's like, I don't know, because I will ask questions and like, if you tell me something, I'm not just going to be like, oh yeah, you're right. And I don't know, it's just like frustrating whenever like I'll listen and try to understand people where they're coming from. But then if I don't just automatically understand and agree with them, then it, I'm a bad person. So I, I just get really frustrated when opinions are pushed on me and I can't question them, so. So do you think sometimes the students don't get into the spirit of liberal arts? Um, yeah, I think like, I don't know. I feel like sometimes it's just a lot to adjust to and maybe like, maybe that makes me ignorant or I don't know. It's just frustrating. I don't even like to be involved with it because it just ends up being a negative experience. So I just like to stay away from it. Okay, so, well, considering you live on campus and you have so many interactions, I admire the students a lot for how much they adjust and get along with lots of different kinds of groups. So in general, the students amaze me and I could never do that. <laughs> but um, it is disappointing to hear sometimes when they, they themselves sort of get into this comfort zone where, you know, just like junior high girlfriends, right? Uh, you know, they, they finish each other's sentences and they never question. Yeah. So yeah, you don't want to go there. Um, Trey, you're the last one, I think. Are you there? All right, so let's go to Confucianism. We have 15 minutes. Um, I just want your first take on Confucian, Confucius and the reading. And then I said in the pre-class video, we're gonna compare it to Aristotle's virtues. I would hope that you would sort of start rolling your eyes after a while and go, what's the problem? Why are we dividing on this? It's obvious. Uh, but very few people have a class like anything like my class. I can guarantee you that for better or worse. Uh, I don't know of anybody else that teaches a class that bridges these divides. Uh, so <laughs> with that, Titus, what did you think when you read about Confucius and Confucianism? Mm, overall, obviously, it was basically another obvious comparison to Jesus and Socrates, but I personally think he was, Confucius was a bit more successful as far as being liked afterwards, because <laughs> it just seems like they, it just seemed like the people weren't as stubborn with him. It seemed like they try to understand his thoughts more. Now he focused more on togetherness within people other than exposing the political 
or the what I'm trying to say the higher ups and embarrassing them but it still seems like they at least try to understand him a lot more than Socrates and Jesus where it was like oh you made me sound bad so yeah we're gonna kill you now <laughs> and that was basically my overall opinion okay like, Michael go ahead yeah, I was just going to comment on that as well, because they, they, you know, they do talk about, like, there was one quote I pulled that, um, let's see, like a, some, some person in like, a, in a political, you know, some kind of thing asked Confucius for help on like how to rule. Um, and then Confucius, let's see, he replied that he better learn to govern himself before trying to govern others, you know, and I think that like, had you know Socrates said that to someone of you know whatever stature like we would have seen like you know so yeah you know yeah I, I mean I guess Socrates obviously was killed but still um and <laughs> a lot of the time it talked about how um Confucius he kind of uh used uh like humor almost and so I feel like he kind of walked the line um that Socrates did but he stayed just on the other side of it uh instead of you know on the, on the worst side of it um and then um, I have some other stuff too that was more just. Yeah. Go ahead, Michael. Okay. Um, so um, let's see. One of the things that I saw uh, was at one point um, he, uh, Confucius, was offered like an official position. Um, and then uh, it was like the person who offered him the position was uh, trying to rebel against the chief. And so I think that that is kind of, that goes back to when Socrates wouldn't leave um, the cell uh, because he was like, you know, if like he would be like a, a, a hypocrite if he didn't also follow the law. And I feel like, um, you know, Confucius was not going to uh, begin in this, in this, um, this job or this position or whatever, if it was just to, um, you know, pull a, a coup or something, you know? Well, political puppet, right? Right. And Jesus was accused of a political move. He wants to be king of the Jews, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, people will try to politicize anybody who gains a following for no matter what reason, right? Right. So watch out. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah it's sad yeah um and then i had just a couple other okay um so there was a huge there was actually just a paragraph that compared confucius to socrates and it talked about his this how he also used some of the socratic ways um so obviously you know there's a comparison that's well known um and then let me scroll down um Sorry, it's highlighted here. Okay, so uh, a lot further down, um, someone asked Confucius, should one love one's enemy, those who do us harm? And he, he said, um, he answered, by no means, answer hatred with justice and love with benevolence. And I felt like that uh, went more along with Socrates. Um, whereas, you know, when we look at um, the view of like Christianity, you know, we kind of go back to that eye for an eye thing. And so I think that that was actually one of the, one of the difference, the differences that I saw rather than like straight comparison. So Confucius is all about appropriate behavior in a relationship, not just this infinite love. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he is. He's into relationships big time. And he's got a lot of things to tell people about how to relate to each other. Um, anybody want to go next? We might run out of time. So who is okay? Okay. okay um, one of my quotes that I picked out kind of um, relates to one of Aristotle's virtues that we've talked about a lot. But um, it was educate citizens and inform them and they can be counted on to behave sensibly. And then he went on to say that had not been fulfilled. And I think that just compares to Aristotle's thoughts on like the middle class and the importance of public education and our um, job to how we talked about the lower class and how they deserve better education. I think that's a huge point. And something that I also talked about um, was it brought up the melting pot and that just brought me to a high school US history class. And um, 
it's basically you know a metaphor that it's um saying like different types of people blend together as one and um despite their differences they manage to coexist and live together as one nation that's what like the one of the definitions of the melting pot and that made me think of like our mlk i think it was the mlk um one about how we talked about the outcast um or that they were outliers or, not, yeah socrates and jesus were outliers yeah right right and so i just think that we're not as much of a melting pot like as we should be even though there are a lot of diversity in america we just don't pay a lot of attention to it and then my last quote that i brought up um it says confucianists thought the young should honor and serve the old um years being not only experience and seasoning but a ripening of wisdom and milling of spirit old or ahead of us and i think that to me just brought up like how much we can learn from our elders and history in itself and i just think that that's what it kind of focused on okay well a big issue with the u.s are we a tossed salad or are we a uh pate <laughs> right put everybody in the blender and every it all comes out alike or do you want a tossed salad right <laughs> like a hetero homogeneous mixture <laughs> that's right <laughs> we can be easily picked apart <laughs> that's right when you're a kid you pick the stuff you want <laughs> uh i think i'm gonna rush through this sorry i would love to Wait, but okay, Caitlin. Um, I didn't really get a chance to read all of it, but um, the one, the few that the parts that I did get to read, I agree with like how Michael said that he kind of walked the line like Socrates. He just stayed a little bit above so that he wasn't as hated. Um, and like you said, the he focused on like love and relationships, but it was like appropriate behavior rather than like overall. So I think that's important, but I haven't read all of it yet. Okay, Akaya. So I, I do agree on like what everybody's been saying about how he was like not really hated and he focused on love and relationships and stuff. And so I um, focused on when it talked about how he had shifted like traditions from an unconscious to a conscious foundation. Um, I just felt like that was important because um, having traditions like within your family and within like a nation is important and it feels like I feel like it gives us a deeper value to our lives and it makes I don't know I just because I know when I read that it made me think of a lot of traditions that me and my family do and um so I just, I thought that was important and that's what stuck out to me the most. Okay, next time we can talk more about that deliberate tradition and we can talk about 4th of July or something like that. Um, okay, Trey. Uh, I think I read the right one and some stuff that stuck out to me, it was, it said, uh, what actions in life have most impacted on humanity and human history? All right, that sound right? Well, it's just uh, reading Houston Smith's book, Confucianism, mm -hmm. and then so I got that outline. It talked about like powers of power of ideas to promote good or evil. And it talked about um, power of ideas to shape minds, souls, and history. So I think that if we do shape our mind and history to, to believe, like I feel like the way we shape our minds is the way that we're going to shape our minds forever. So basically if if i was to tell my child hey you know this is the right way and this is the wrong way then i feel like he'd be on the right track to like go on and proceed through that uh through that type of way so i think i do believe that the way we shape our minds is is a huge impact on what we talk about and how we deal with each other and like all of our personalities here in today's life um and then along with the power of uh to promote good or evil we're always going to do our best to promote good. But then again, there are some people that are going to like promote evil and we can't really stop them uh, and what they choose to talk about or how they choose to do things. 
because once again, everybody has their own opinion, but it's, it, it, in my case, I'm gonna do my best to promote as much good as I possibly can to better off the world, so. Okay, and then Jason. Um, yeah, I just wanna talk about how like, um, Confucius was like, he was like a big believer in like paying it forward to his elders, kind of like respecting them. Um, kind of find that hard because like coming from like a, a culture that like, like puts the respect above like all things, like respect run extremely deep. Um, I kind of, it's kind of hard when like, and, and it's not even like towards the elders either. It's just to like others in general. It's kind of hard to like, you know, give something to someone else that like it, it's not like giving back to you you know like respect is, is it's earned not given i can't just you know I'll walk into a room and i see somebody and like uh someone i don't even know right um let's say it's like a family function and someone i don't even know and, and out of the blue i automatically got to respect them it's kind of like i don't even i don't even know this person yet i have to like give them my utmost respect but um, I kind of just wanted to talk about that and like, how, cause like nowadays it's, um, I'm sure like everybody's on, I want to say everybody's on the same page. It, um, it's more of like respect has to be earned. It's not okay. something you can hand okay. out. I mean, yeah, those are all good points. And I'll, what, what do you do when one of my students says that her grandma, I mean, there's more than one student says she, she wants to get back to the good old days of Jim Crow because like everybody knew their place, right? Yep. So I'll, what do you do about that, right? Uh, tell them they're crazy. Well, I mean, there are grandparents who are reactionary, right? Because the world is too complicated and there was a good old days in their head when it, when it was simpler. So how do you do, how do you deal with that? And well, I, just actually, I got to, kind of wrap it up, but these are things for you to think about. So we have the assignment. And then one thing is uh, the US, we left the past, right? The US, as Mr. Smith says in his book, we are the most traditionless society in history, right? People left and they're gonna start all over, blank slate, we're gonna just create this whole, whole new country. We're gonna create whole new human nature. We're not gonna evil anymore. We're gonna get it all right. We're not gonna, we're gonna have middle class, blah, blah. Uh, it's very optimistic. Um, so in general, looking, just respecting your elders is a very conservative society that doesn't adjust to change very well, right? Um, in a progressive society that can adjust to change and maintain a middle class within a whole bunch of changes. That, you know, is often, hey, grandma, you just don't know. But, you know, I got to know about technology. You don't know anything about it. But you got to believe that I'm not corrupt just because I'm a computer nerd, right? <laughs> or something like that, right? So, I, I think that there's a responsibility for each generation to plant the seeds they could, but then to pass on power to the next generation and to, a, to just face the fact that the next generation has a more complex reality to deal with because the societies get more complex, right? So you don't hold them back, right? But, you know, the U.S. is on one extreme, the least respect for tradition, and China is on the other extreme, right? So the reading for next time, again, I've been warning you about this, has our founding fathers, they wanted the declaration, that they wanted to focus on minimal government and freedom law, but they wanted you all to have Confucius values where you had, you, you uh, wove people together and had a really deep concern for each other's well-being within the context of a minimal government, right? So they did not want you to develop the character trait of calculating the most efficient means to your own economic well-being in everything you do, right? That was not what they wanted. That's what you do, you know, so... 
yeah, I do think we have to think about what we inherited and in the world that you're moving into, especially climate change, but not just that, we have to deal with racism. They had slavery. We have to deal with sexism. You know, there's stuff your generation has to do that you can respect your elders for what they did right, but you just have to say, sorry, uh, you didn't get that one right, or you didn't do enough, whatever. And just have a, a reasonable relationship between the generations, right? Not too much respect and not too little respect. Um, I'm gonna let you go because I am gonna try to get to the frozen yogurt place before it closes in 15 minutes. And I'll tell you next time if I made it. I missed it last yesterday, so uh, I'm out of here. Okay, guys, bye-bye. <laughs>